San Onofre is a pressurized water reactor. They keep the water under pressure so it cannot boil. The heat of that cooling water goes first through pipes three feet across. From that huge three-foot pipe, it gets subdivided into maybe 19,000 very small tubes. And they're very small so that they have a large surface area. Those tubes are flooded on the outside with water that will cool them off. That water gets hot, turns to steam. That steam hits the turbine that turns the generator. The other piece of that is the nuclear water is at 2,200 pounds per square inch. And the non-nuclear side, the clean water, is at 1,000 pounds per square inch. 1,000 pounds per square inch difference across the two. That's a half ton per square inch. Yes, yes. If one side's 2,000, the other side's 1,000. The garden hose is like 50 or 60 pounds pressure, and this is 1,000 pounds pressure across that tube. The tubes have to be as thin as possible to efficiently transfer heat from the inside, the radioactive side, to the outside that's going to run the turbine. So a small pinhole leak very rapidly becomes a large leak because it, it erodes very, very quickly. What leaks will be from the high-pressure side, the radioactive nuclear side, out into the water that goes to the turbine. When you have that much pressure, you tend to get vibration. What happened at San Onofre was that uh, they had steam generators that were um, enormous. The, the combustion steam generators, um, combustion engineering made the San Onofre reactor. And they decided that for a reactor of... Um, San Onofre size, they only need two steam generators. Most other pressurized water reactors have four. All pressurized water reactors of that size have four. So essentially the steam generators on a combustion reactor are twice as big as the steam generators on a Westinghouse reactor. How big is that? It's 70 feet tall and it weighs almost 600 tons each. So it's 70 feet tall, 20-something feet across at the top, and it's filled with tubes. We've got the hot radioactive water, 650 degrees Fahrenheit, going through those tubes very, very fast, high pressure. They're held apart by the tube sheet. The tube sheet starts its life as a giant discus. If you think of it, it's 13 feet in diameter, and it's 2 feet deep, and it's solid steel. So think of it as a giant dime or a giant quarter, but 13 feet by 2 feet. And it weighs, oh, God, hundreds of tons. Then it goes to the shop, and they drill 19,000 holes in it. So it loses about 90% of its weight after it's drilled. And into each one of those holes, a tube is pushed. Then those, uh, the tube has an, in, uh, an inlet side, and it goes up through the U, and then it goes back down to the other side. So in other words, the water is going up? It probably goes up uh, 35 or 40 feet, turns, and then goes back down 40 feet, and comes out the other side. That holds the bottom of the tubes apart. And then as you go up, they would still wobble and destroy themselves, except then they put in egg crates. And each one of these tubes is forced through an egg crate as they go up on either side. And then at the top, as they curve, there's also a lattice structure in there to keep these things from rattling and banging into each other. It seems that on San Onofre, with this new steam generator design, they didn't get it right. Tubes are banging into each other instead of being held stationary. Now, the old steam generators lasted more than 25 years. They had to be replaced because tubes were deteriorating. Yeah, that's correct. Although deterioration at the end of their life was slower, people have learned over time how to manage a steam generator. Supposedly, the steam generator was a perfect match for the old steam generator. If they had built the identical steam generators and put the identical steam generators in, this problem wouldn't have occurred. But they decided to juice them up and add more tubes and change the flow rates and on and on and on. There's a, a series of problems. Um, but from the outside, this steam generator looks almost identical to the one they removed. The difference is the guts. It's sort of like putting a supercharger under your hood. 
you know, the car looks the same, but in fact, it's got an entirely different engine. And yet, Southern California Edison told the NRC, and the NRC went along with their statement, that this was essentially like for like. In other words, there was no significant difference. You know, I went back into um, the NRC records, and the meeting was held that, were, that they discussed this issue of like for like uh, June 16th, 2006. The meeting notes are missing. Oof. So here's the NRC just last week saying, well, they, we know they told us the truth. And when you go back in to find out what it was they told them, the meeting notes are missing. Um, so it's, it's hard for me to imagine how the NRC can reconfirm that Southern California Edison did tell the truth when, in fact, they don't even have the meeting notes in their own file. How did they juice up these steam generators? Did they change the composition, the alloy of the metal out of which the tubes are fabricated? They did two things. The first thing they did, and I would agree with the first thing they did, they changed from an Inconel 600 to an Inconel 690 alloy. Inconel and, is stainless steel. Yeah, and it's got lots of other stuff in it, but it's a, it's a special alloy of stainless steel. It's a really great alloy for high-temperature water, especially Inconel 690, does not corrode in a very nasty environment. It is a very hard material. By the time it's alloyed, it's a very hard material. But the 690 is, uh, wasn't available 25 years ago. It developed over time, and it's a great alloy. And I think every new steam generator has 690 tubes. Managing the steam generators means essentially managing the water, water chemistry. You've got to keep that water as non-corrosive as possible. How do you do that? You keep it as clean as possible. The water in a nuclear plant is the purest of pure water you can possibly get. And even then, you know, if you take a teapot and you uh, keep adding water and boiling it off and adding water and boiling it off and adding water and boiling it off, no matter how clean the water is, eventually you get a thick scum on the bottom of the teapot. So what they do to avoid that, because that's what's happening in a in a YouTube steam generator, the water's going in, steam is going out. Well, all that junk that's in water does not carry over with the steam. It's pure steam. So whatever dirt is in the water stays in the steam generator. So over time, it forms surfaces that can corrode where the tubes meet the tube sheets and where the tubes meet the egg crate. And over time, it also affects the heat exchange ability. So what they do is they start with the cleanest of clean water, and even then it's not perfect, but they, they remove about 1% or 2% of the water all the time. So it's like instead of boiling your teapot dry, you pour off the last little bit, and then you fill it back up and you pour off the last little bit. It's called blowdown. They remove about 1% to 2% of the water coming in, goes out as blowdown. And you'll see that. You can tell when a pressurized water reactor is running because you'll see some steam coming out the side of the building, and that's blowdown steam. It's normally non-radioactive. But when you get a tube leak, of course, now that secondary side is radioactive, and you'll release uh, radioactive steam up that. But it's critical to get that water chemistry right. And initially, when San Onofre was built in the early 80s, they didn't have it right. And so they had tube failures that now are avoidable. So just going to a better alloy with the, 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 our better understanding of how to manage the water would have meant that the new steam generators would have lasted 40, 50 years. But instead what happened is Southern California Edison made another decision. They decided to add even more tubes to the biggest steam generator that's ever been built, essentially. And that way they'd be able to pull more heat out of the reactor water. I believe that in the back of their mind was that a couple of years from now, they were going to get a power increase, and they were going to use those extra tubes to get extra power out of the old reactor. Now, there's nothing on the record that says that, but the only conclusion I can draw is that they added those extra tubes because they wanted to get uh, 40, 50, 60 more megawatts out of that nuclear reactor eventually. So I, I call it a stealth power up rate. You know, they were going to put the steam generator in on the ratepayer's expense and claim it was just a one-for-one -one replacement. 
And then a couple of years from now, they were going to say, oh, my God, we've got all this extra steam. Let's, um, let's sell it for electricity. They did that by making major changes to the guts of the, of the machine. That 4% change in tubes required a whole series of changes. That tube sheet down at the very bottom had to have more holes drilled in it. Well, there was no room. So they took out a big structural support, something called a stay cylinder. And that was the structural member that held the tube sheet together. Is that why it was called a stay cylinder and made things stay in place? Yes. Combustion is the only one that uses a stay cylinder because their generators are so huge in comparison to Westinghouse. Let me just remind our listeners that when you say combustion, you're referring to the corporation Combustion Engineering. This has nothing to do with combustion and fire. These are nuclear plants. But that's, well, the company came from doing combustion work. Yes, Combustion Engineering is an old firm that started with with burning coal and and oil, and uh, they moved into nuclear, but they were called Combustion Engineering. Uh, They really no longer exist. They were bought by by a German firm, which got bought by another firm. And, um, the, but, but back in the day, they, they built boilers, whether it was a nuclear boiler or a coal boiler or an oil boiler. Combustion engineering was a force to be reckoned with. And that I've had problems where I'm trying to find out details about a certain plant made by, in this case it was, I believe, uh, combustion engineering. And I get in touch and I say, why was this design made? A lot of our plants that are still working are rather unique. They're one-off. And uh, I say, well, why was it designed this way? And no one seems to remember, and the company doesn't exist anymore. Yes, you're right. Combustion only made 14 nuclear plants. Three Mile Island was made by Babcock and Wilcox. They made seven. Then Combustion made 14. And then um, Westinghouse made all the rest, which is uh, about 50. And then the others are made by General Electric, but those are boiling water reactors. Now, none of that capability is, um, is, is in the U.S. I can remember as, a, as an engineer in the 70s going to Chattanooga, which was where all of these uh, vessels were made, and seeing a building. It was about half a mile long with steam generator after steam generator. It was, um, it was very impressive. All of that has moved to Japan, and Mitsubishi now is the heavy manufacturer, along with Siemens in Germany. So we, the United States no longer has that capability. Now, Mitsubishi has only made two combustion steam generators. One is only half as big. It's at Fort Calhoun. It doesn't need a stay cylinder because it's so small. But as these generators got bigger and bigger and bigger, they put this pillar in the middle of it to hold it up. Well, what Edison and Mitsubishi decided is that they would yank that pillar out and they drill some more holes. Well, now this disc, this tube sheet, is not being supported, so they had to make the tube sheet thicker, and there was a whole bunch of cascading problems that came from that, especially with flow velocity. And, of course, velocity determines the frequency at which the tubes vibrate. So they tinkered with something that was perfectly good in order to put in more tubes. And I believe that at the end of the day, you know, sometime in the summer or fall or whenever the analysis is done, if you follow it to its root, you're going to find that the problems on the new generator could have been completely avoided if they had just added Inconel 690 tubes to the old steam generator design. But instead they decided to supercharge it, and I think that's where the problem lies. Added 690 and left it at that. That would have been fine, and I would be testifying that it was a smart decision. But when you do that and add 400 tubes to a generator that's already the biggest in the world, there's a problem there, and I cannot understand why they would do that if it weren't for the fact that they wanted to get more power out. Go for an upgrade. If you look at nuclear reactors around the country, the boiling water reactors, where the water goes straight down a tube into the turbine, they can get 20% power up rates. They're allowed, and a lot of them have. So that's going from generating 1,000 megawatts, which is a gigawatt, a billion watts, up to 1,200 megawatts. That's right. The pressurized water reactors are limited not by law. They can still go for 20%, but none of the steam generators are big enough to handle a, a, a real high up rate. The highest up rate I've seen on a pressurized reactor is about 11%. The incremental cost to do that 
if you don't have to replace the steam generators, because remember now, the steam generators are paid for in San Onofre by the ratepayers. But if you want to then squeeze more power out, the incremental cost is around $300 million. And for that, you pick up, you know, like you said, a couple hundred megawatts of power. It's real cheap power in comparison to building a power plant from scratch if you've already gussied up the steam generator. The tubes, instead of lasting for the 20 or 30 or 40 years that they were expected to last, are going out after less than two years. Do we know for sure that it's because of vibration? I just read a report today, and, and the, the, this is the 16th of April, where um, uh, filed with the NRC by Mitsubishi, and they are saying that the cause of the tube damage on Unit 2 is vibration at the top, at the U-tubes. And if you think about it, if this long, skinny tube is the weakest point is at the top where it's fluttering, and apparently it's colliding with other tubes, as well as the uh, tube support structure that's up there. And that combination led to, on Unit 2, which is the better one, Mitsubishi is now reporting 90% through-wall cracks on, on some of the tubes. Through-wall cracks, in other words, the crack goes all the way through the wall. 90%, a little bit left, right. So what can happen if you get many of these that are side-by-side, if it's a problem in a zone of the heat exchanger, they can cascade. You can get one failure, the tube will snap, and then it will whip and hit the next one and hit the next one. In which case, you, you don't have a, a, a minor release of radiation. You've got a major nuclear accident because now suddenly you've got pressurized radioactive steam leaving the nuclear reactor and causing a lost coolant accident. So the concern here is, is a real safety concern, is that if these cascading tubes were to fail, that one would bang into the other, bang into the other, and you could lose hundreds and possibly even thousands of gallons a minute out of the primary system, which then the only way to make it up is to turn on the emergency core cooling, and basically you've got a small accident. And on the other side, that radiation has bypassed the containment, and it's being released out the blowdown line, out the uh, atmospheric dumps, and things like that. So on San Onofre especially, it's, um, it's a, a definite concern because Route 5, he- heading due north-south, is right next to the nuclear reactor. So if this cascading effect were to occur, not the little pinhole leak they had back in January, but if that leak had grown or if they had cascaded, it's possible you would have had to shut down Route 5. Don't they listen to what's happening inside the steam generator so they know if there's vibration going on? Uh, that's, that's a brilliant question. The answer is no. And I'm going to recommend, when the time is right, that they put in acoustic monitoring so they can hear these tubes flutter and hear them banging into each other. That's not a requirement, and they don't normally do it. We've had that problem in other reactors, too. On the boiling water reactors, the steam dryers were failing, and the NRC forced the boiling water reactors to put in acoustic monitors to listen for the the, the tubes hitting each other. And I suspect that's going to be one of the things that come out of uh, San Onofre, is that they're going to demand an acoustic monitor so they can hear these tubes rattling around in there. Both reactors at San Onofre are shut down now. Where do we go from here? Both San Onofre and Mitsubishi are keeping the reactor shut down. This isn't anti-nuclear folks. It's not the NRC. It's the licensee itself is saying, we don't know enough to start this unit up. Mitsubishi, in the report that was released today, just said that it's going to be June 1 before they even think they can figure it out. I think that's optimistic. So, of course, once Mitsubishi figures it out, assuming that, that they, they meet that optimistic schedule. It then goes to the NRC, and the NRC kicks it around and uh, determines whether or not some additional work is required. Certainly, we've got um, two months more of shutdown at a minimum. And then the question is, what do you do? If the tubes are rattling around and you plug the tubes, that prevents the radioactive water from running through the tube, but it doesn't prevent the tube from fluttering because the fluttering is likely caused on the secondary side. 
the secondary side, meaning the presumably clean water side. That's right. The non-radioactive side, you can't get into the secondary side. The tubes are so tight. The tubes are so densely packed. You'd have to be a carpenter ant or something like that to get between them. There's nothing you can do to get into uh, where the where these vibrations are occurring. My concern is that there's so many of these tubes fluttering that it can begin to do damage not just to the tube that's next to it, but to the tube support sheets that are built in there. You can begin to get a, a larger problem. How much water is flowing through the primary side? In other words, how much radioactive water is flowing through the steam generator at any one time? quarter of a million gallons every minute. And it flows through two pipes, one to each generator. And you were right, it was a 30, I think it's a 30 or 32 inch pipe, a little less than three feet. So, you know, you or I can crawl through this thing with no trouble. And then it goes into these thousands of little tubes, and then on the other side it comes out through two 22 inch pipes. So there's one big pipe going in and two smaller pipes going out. But a 22 inch pipe is something that you can crawl inside too. They're huge pipes. Arnie, it's always good talking with you. I I always learn a lot. Thank you very much. Okay, Al. Thanks. Talk to you again. Bye-bye. I've been speaking with Arnie Gunderson, licensed nuclear operator and nuclear engineer, a consultant with Fairwinds Associates. For KVMR, I'm Al Stoller.